Fear, in my opinion, is the best safety tool you can have. More than the halo, more than the uh, runoff areas, more than um, anything else. Drivers should be, with certain extent, afraid and evaluate the risks. Welcome to Beyond the Grid with me, Tom Clarkson. My guest this week is a driver best known for winning the Le Mans 24 hours, but he was also a brilliant single-seater driver and he raced in Formula One for three seasons. And more than the actual racing, he also got to test perhaps the best car in the history of Formula One on a regular basis. The man I'm talking about is, of course, Emanuele Pirro. He raced for Benetton in 1989 and Scuderia Italia for the following two years, while simultaneously testing for McLaren Honda. And his reflections on that period are truly fascinating. But his passion for motorsport is intense and extends beyond actual driving. So when FIA President Jean Todd proposed the idea of having driver stewards at Grand Prix, Emanuele jumped at the opportunity and he now attends a handful of races in that role every year. So sit back and enjoy hearing from a man who's experienced pretty much everything in motorsport and whose passion for Formula One remains as infectious today as it was when he started karting. I hope you enjoy our conversation. Emanuele, it is lovely to have you on the show. Thank you for your time. Now, let's talk Formula One to start with. You're a man who's achieved so much, but let's talk Formula One. 37 races. How do you reflect on it? How do you reflect on, on Formula One? Formula One, as every young driver, was, was my dream, especially before I knew what motor racing was about. So I started to do karting with a dream by far nothing closer than a dream because I wasn't coming from a wealthy family. I had my my career. I got to Formula One rather late and uh, my whole lifespan in terms of racing career has been a lot wider than Formula One. So I understand many people, uh, how to say, uh, classify you as a Formula One driver or a non-Formula One driver. Uh, in that respect, I'm happy to be classified in the first category. However, in terms of uh, personal satisfaction, uh, thank God I, I could fulfill my, my bag of uh, happiness in, uh, in other areas. And uh, I grew up with a, with a group of uh, drivers slightly older than me uh, since karting in Italy, Eddie Cheever, Elio De Angelis, Andrea De Cesaris, and especially Andrea and um, and Eddie, they did many years of Formula One, many, many, I think beyond expectations with, a, let's say, a, a moderate success. And I, I, I knew them and of course I followed them and I admired them. And I was racing in other categories, lower categories, with success. So I was always thinking, what is better to, to be at, at the very top of motorsport with moderate success or having personal satisfaction and fulfillment in, in other areas? I don't know. I was happy with what I had. It's an interesting point, isn't it? You only got to Formula One when you were 27, yet you'd won in everything on the way up. Why did it take you so long to get that break, do you think? I was really lucky to bump into Marlboro uh, in the early days of of my career. Uh, Marlboro, for those who are juniors, it's like uh, it was like Red Bull today. So it would really help you out and, and it was an incredible tool to, to help you during your career. So I was sponsored by them in uh, Formula 3, Formula 3000, Formula 2 and Formula 3000. But then, uh, for some reasons, um, I did two years in Formula 3000 and nothing happened. Or there was a close call actually by Brabham or by Bernie in 85. Hang on, that's a good story there. Surely anything involving <laughs> Bernie Ecclestone is a good story. He offered you a drive. Yes, yes, he did. This was halfway through, halfway through the season, and I was leading the Formula Three Thousand Championship, and uh, I was living in London. So, I got a call from Mike Earl, my team principal, great guy, and he said um, he actually was a funny guy, 
So he said, um, how are you? And I said, I'm, I'm good. Um, are you standing or sitting? And I said, uh, <laughs> what sort of question, Mike? Uh, no, answer. I, I am standing because in those days there was one telephone in, in, in the house and I, I was standing. I said, take a chair and sit down. Come on, Mike. He, you know, he, he was used to make some jokes like that. And he said, please do it. So I obey. I sit down and he said, um, I got a call from Bernie. He will call you shortly to offer you a drive. I said, what? If I was standing, I would, I would faint because Brabham at the time was the team. So they agreed and, uh, and uh, Mike was kind enough with Marlborough to release me. So I get a call from Bernie who actually introduced himself like Bernard Eccleston. He was, he had the most charming, sexy voice you could uh, you could imagine and i thought this guy you know he would intimidate you but by all means he was actually making you feel super comfortable and he said um can you come and see me in the office how long would it take and of course i with the a to z i already worked out how long it took and i said bernie between 29 and 30 minutes so <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so I go there and I find this big desk with one pen only. On the contrary, my desk is small with a lot of paper on top. And, uh, and he said, uh, we have a problem with our driver, who was Francois Henault. He will stop and we need a replacement. And we thought of you, do you feel ready for Formula One? And to be honest, I said, Bernie, I don't know. I never drove it, which with the hindsight, I would suggest any junior to show more self-confidence. I was just uh, over honest, but I don't think this is the reason why I didn't get to drive. However, he said, uh, we are at Silverstone tomorrow just for some filming days with Pirelli. You can go and get just familiar to the car. Then you come back and we sign a contract. And I, you, I, I was beyond, beyond. I wasn't in, on the moon. I was in Mars. I was in Mars. <laughs> <laughs> but please keep it for yourself. Don't share it with anybody. So I go there, make the seat. Brabham there was, uh, there was uh, Herbie Blash, there was Charlie Whiting. They made me feel incredibly home, which for me was quite unusual because I thought these people are intimidating you and so on and so forth. And then um, I go back to Bernie and he says, uh, well, um, we have some pressure from BMW to run a BMW driver for the next two races, which were Detroit and Canada. And I thought that's quite good because starting with a 1200 horsepower car that you don't know in Detroit, is, it's a rather difficult challenge. And then you will start from Paul Ricard. Just be patient and uh, I'll call you. He never called me. So <laughs> this was... Uh, that was it. Yeah, that was it. And, uh, and in fact, I never really asked him, but uh, I, I should have just at least asked him. But um, yeah. What a great story. How intimidating was Bernie? So you were 22, 23 at the time, desperate to get into Formula One. Were, were you a little bit intimidated by him, a little bit scared? I was intimidated by, by my expectations, but uh, I've always been a big fan of Bernie for what he did to Formula One since the early 70s. And, um, and, and I found a person completely different to what I expected. And his charm and his, his way of making you feel comfortable. I would assign him a check of uh, sharing my earnings for the next part of my life. And, uh, and I, I really, really liked him. And of course, this was disappointing because uh, I wasn't also smart enough to keep the focus in the Formula 3000 championship, which eventually I managed not to win. So this was not really a good thing for me, but I have to say, I can only say thank you. He's, he's a wonderful person. Did you do that Pirelli test, uh, the filming day for Yes, him? yes, yes, yes. I drove the car and, oh my goodness, it was incredibly powerful. But the most uh, astonishing thing, Tom, was uh, because in those days, the cars had a lot, a lot of drag, a lot of power and a lot of drag. And Silverstone, the old Silverstone was super fast. And basically, they they relied on, on a massive rear wing to generate downforce. So once I backed off on the straight at top speed, and it was like somebody punching on my face just for the just for the drag. So it was a brutal car. But at the end of the day, a car is a car, two pedals, one steering wheel. And uh, eventually, when you go higher in the categories, you just things happen a little quicker. But if you can drive 
well in Formula 3, no reason why you can't drive well in Formula 2, and no reason why you can't drive well in Formula 1 car. So that was 1985. You don't actually get your break until 1989. Um, what happened in the intervening four years? Any other near misses? <laughs> no, no, not really. Uh, I had a chat with Ken Tiru, who was the team to start your career. He, well, he was nice. He was asking 200,000 US dollars, which is very little, quite frankly, very little. And actually, uh, the dad of a good friend of mine was prepared to loan me this money. But I thought, you, it's just not good to put your own pocket money into racing. And um, so I I never managed to, to race. And after my second Formula 3000 year in 86, uh, it just my single city career was, uh, was over. Uh, fortunately, in um, two years before, I started a touring car career, thanks to BMW and thanks to my two good friends, Gerard Berger and Roberto Ravaglia, who started one year before. Roberto for good, with an incredible success, and Gerard has a side activity like me. They invited me to race in Monza with a 635. Touring car in those days was something for, let's say, uh, differently young people. <laughs> so not, not, not really for young people. You wouldn't really think about it. But the Works BMW team, especially the Schnitzer team uh, with the great uh, and uh, never forgotten Charlie Lamb at the helm made me f really enjoy everything. Roberto, uh, Gerard, it was a wonderful atmosphere. So I thought, wow, this is a good way to do. So I signed a contract with BMW to do all the non-clashing races. With all due respect, I, I, I just uh, kept it as a plan B in case my single-seater career wouldn't work. So at the end of 86, I thought, okay, let's go for touring car. No, no big drama. I, I was an established driver. It was enjoyable. 87, I did nothing but touring cars. Then... Talking about sliding doors, my good friend Stefan Johansson, with whom uh, he, he was a little bit my my model, my inspiration, because he's, he's a smart guy, he was successful, and uh, we we were good friends and seeing each other in London. He calls me up at the end of uh, 87 and says, um, uh, Emanuele, what are you doing uh, in a few weeks? I said, what do you mean? Well, he was driving for McLaren at the time, and he said, um, Marlboro wants to film a commercial, a, a big commercial with actually Tony Scott as a director. So it was also an experience. And uh, with, with two drivers, but Alain, Alain Prost cannot make it. So they look for a driver. And I thought, maybe if you're free, we can go together. It will be done in Phoenix, Arizona. We will have fun. They pay you. Oh, for, for sure, for sure. So uh, go and talk to Ron sign a small agreement, go there. And in the meantime, uh, Ron told me, you know, we are uh, setting up, because they were running with the TAC Porsche engine at the time, we're setting up a test team. We just made a deal with Honda. We need to do a, a, an intense development program. We set up a test team in Japan. We look for a driver. Would you like to do it? And uh, I said, sure. Uh, it, Japan at the time was further away than now. Of course, not in a geographical standpoint, but you know, flying there required a stopover. There was no internet. It wasn't as easy for a young guy to go there as it would be today. But I thought, first of all, I always loved challenges. I just went and they organized the Formula 3000 championship with Honda to race. And we were doing a, a development for starting in, in 88 with the glorious um, MP44, which was probably one of the best cars ever built in the history of motorsport. Three days a week, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, every second week, the whole year. Wow. What an opportunity for you. Now, interesting that Ron offered you that uh, without seeing you drive because you were a touring car driver at the time. Were you quite were you quite surprised? Or? Obviously, he has a good sniff for great talents. <laughs> Clearly. <laughs> Clearly. Absolutely. <laughs> no, seriously, I, I, I don't know. Um, maybe he didn't think any special skill was required. Maybe because he, he was actually very close to Mike Earl. 
And I knew Ron through my curls. So probably, I guess he asked Mike, I've always been a rather technical guy, very interested in, in, in all the development parts. So maybe this was the reason. Maybe he didn't find anybody. I don't know. All I know is that I, I am ever so grateful because this was not only an eye-opening opportunity. And then he said, uh, we can offer you a test contract with an option to become permanent driver. But to be honest, you know, the drivers would be Ayrton Senna and Alan Prost. So the chances that you will show being better than them are not that great just for the sake of the records. But um, but I got uh, I got also this option for one million dollar salary in case they would pick me. <laughs> but uh, it, it was great. Um, the Honda people were fantastic. The McLaren people, especially Tim Wright, who was my permanent engineer, who was also engineering Alan Prost, uh, Alan and and Ayrton were good. So this was really an incredible opportunity. Quite hard, but incredible. What was Ron Dennis like to deal with? Was he as straightforward as Bernie? Was did he have the sort of ch- the same charm as Bernie? Uh, a little different because Ron, uh, I don't think there is anybody like Ron. Ron, he 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 was a sophisticated person in a way. He was very paying very m- much attention to how he spoke, and everything was well studied and well organized and. Um, no, very different from Bernie. I think Bernie was very is very essential, and um, and for Ron, I think the cosmetics and the appearance and the presentation was uh, as important as the substance. But I mean, I, it's not me to say that these two people are incredibly high profile people, and uh, and you you can only learn from them. And and I've been grateful. And and in fact. Uh, there was an episode at the end of 1988, which I very rarely share, but I got a call from uh, Ferrari. One rare days that I was in, in Italy because there were no uh, telephones at the time. Uh, telephone rings and this uh, the sporting director of Ferrari, end of 88, when McLaren won every single race, if you remember, but one, which I I believe in God. I don't believe in miracles, but it's it's hard to prove that this was not a miracle. That you know, just after uh, Enzo Ferrari passed away, um, miraculously both McLarens retire with a little help of uh, Jean-Louis Lesser and uh, and the Ferrari wins in Monza. If you make a movie, you think these things will never happen, but. Nevertheless, after an incredible season, uh, this gentleman from Ferrari says, uh, introduce himself. What are you doing? Can you come and see us in, uh, in Maranello? I thought, what for? It was a similar shock than the Bernie telephone call. Uh, I was a little more mature. And I said, yes, I will be back. I'm leaving to Japan tomorrow evening. I will be back in three weeks. Uh, we can set an appointment. No, no, no. We need to see you immediately. We need to see you immediately. You know, very like disappointed that I would not jump in the car. And I said, yeah, I would love to, but, uh, but I'm leaving. So I come to Rome. So he comes to Rome and we met in the Excelsior Hotel in the, the next morning prior to my departure to Japan. And he says, um, well, we would like to offer you a test contract because we see your abilities with McLaren and so on and so forth. And uh, we would like you to do the same job for us. And I say, wow, that's uh, flattening. Thank you very much. But um, what else do you offer? Just for the records, money were 100% not counting to me at at that time, just career opportunities. So we never went that far. And, uh, And I said, well, you will most likely drive for us unlike Ron, who said most unlikely, very honestly, most likely uh, drive for us, but we cannot really put it into writing. And and honestly, I thought, Tom, um, uh, now you will laugh and people listening would laugh because, uh, but I thought if you don't offer something more, not to be greedy, but I'm loyal to Ron Dennis. He gave me a golden opportunity. I can't just go to Ron Dennis and say, Ron, sorry, I have the same job at Ferrari. Thank you very much. See you whenever, you know. I, I just thought it was not not fair, even considering that the call came from Ferrari. So I told him, 
I'm sorry, but if you don't offer me a contract, not to be greedy, not to be arrogant, but just for me, it, it's not fair. And uh, they were not prepared to do. And actually, when I told Ron, he was furious, furious, furious. And so Furious what? That... That you'd had the meeting or that Ferrari had gone chasing? That Ferrari asked me. Yeah, that Ferrari asked me. And, um, well, it, it's not something to be proud of, but <laughs> I don't know how many people turn the Ferrari offer down. Wow. And Italians as well. I mean, But my sense of loyalty and, uh, and honesty, um, it, it goes beyond, beyond anything. And, uh, and it really was, was a big deal what, um, what Ron offered. And it, it turned out to be a very good relationship because in 89 I got asked to buy Benetton to to drive and and for the following three years I, I was a permanent Formula One driver for the opposition or driving for let's say other teams and I kept doing my job at McLaren as a test driver which <laughs> with today's mentality would be absolutely impossible just to show what relationship we we had with uh, Honda and McLaren and it and it showed the trust that Ron Dennis had in you, didn't it? And Honda, because Honda um, initially they were very reluctant. When I got to Suzuka first time, I got there in the evening, and uh, you know you try to familiarize with your Italian way, which is definitely very different from a Japanese way. We are very warm at the beginning, and uh, and I asked, what is the shifting point of the engine? You know, ah, you will know tomorrow. And so, so I thought, okay, that's no good. This is not a good start. But it didn't take long to gain a very, very good trust and also friendship, you know, with special people like Osamu Goto or Michio Sakaino. It was a, a beautiful adventure. Uh, we were a small team with Tim Wright and uh, nothing but good memories. So what happened? McLaren sent a, an MP442 Japan and it stayed there permanently and then Honda would just put engine developments in the back of it and did you just go to Suzuka or were there other other racetracks as well? A couple of times we went to Fuji but mainly was Suzuka. Initially it was um, the Porsche car with the Honda engine then uh, a little bit into the season the 4.4 was ready so we took that then we we made a an hybrid car with a V10 for the next year, which was an, a big challenge because uh, because the drivability of the engine, especially for Senna, was very very important. So an interim car, then the actual car, then the V12, which was a monster. Ah, beautiful, beautiful. What were the strengths of the MP44? Balance, not in terms of uh, balance understeer to oversteer, just uh, an equilibrium of everything. I don't think there was anything which really excelled. It was just a good car altogether. And I think sometimes people uh, focus too much into one item. You know, they try to find a golden bullet with uh, with one particular uh, thing. All cars are good, but sometimes they don't really talk the same language, all, all the components. And, and that was really good. It was a, not a difficult car to drive. The two drivers were outstanding. And, and I think the combination made them both even better than they were because uh, probably with them separate, they would not have risen their level so high. But the... It was a privilege to be there, to learn from them. And I learned a lot, not really to go faster, because I think the speed is something you either have or don't have. But I realized that they were doing a lot of things better than I was doing and things that I could learn. You know, commitment, uh, uh, analysis of the car, always look for what they could do to improve them, motivating the team and making sure that everybody was on the same page. There was a, a lot of things that actually I could copy from them. And it's, it's a privilege. You only learn these things by being close to certain special people. And so for me, it's been almost a life changing. How often were you actually testing alongside them at the same time? Uh, not very often. I did a few uh, FOCA, so-called FOCA tests in Europe. So I remember once um, I did the first two days in Herets and Alain came uh, the, for the second two days. But 
otherwise just by myself. And and would they sort of listen to your debriefs? I remember I remember David Coulthard telling a story about Senna just staying to watch him drive, listen to his debriefs, to 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 know whether he could trust Coulthard's feedback. And I wonder whether were, were Prost and Senna like that with you? No, not really, because I was doing the job by myself, and um, I think they were benefit from from our work. But actually, trusting or not. Th- y- don't forget that there was a lot of opportunities to test. So I think Honda and McLaren were coming or proposing certain solutions that we tested. And it, it doesn't take long to see whether these things work or not. But I would lie if I say they were listening to my words and uh, uh, because there was no opportunity, actually. But they were both very nice, really nice, which is good and bad because um, maybe... They were nice because they didn't see me as a threat, because normally you are not nice to somebody who is threatening you. I don't know, but uh, uh, Senna, I, I knew him since 78 from karting, so it was a little easier. But Alan has always been charming, helpful, so very, very good. You said a moment ago that Senna was, uh, the, the drivability of the engine was very important to Senna in particular. What about this bouncing of the throttle that he used to do, the sort of stabbing of the throttle, such a, a unique to him, I'm told? Yeah, initially, um, people and even Alain thought that this was the reason why he was so fast with the turbo car. But I think he was fast because he was fast and this was just uh, a side effect. Uh, he used to do that and uh, and so with much less electronical tools than today, the uh, initial engine pickup and the throttle map was uh, all mechanical, given by different um, the multiplication or lever leverages, and uh, and this was quite quite some work to do. That it was has been very beneficial to me in on a later stage of my career, and uh, but this is subjective, so there is no one good solution or. or or one less good solution depends. You know, the power is like a budget that you have. You have a salary at the end of the month. You might want a lot of money in the first week and less money in the in, in at the end of the month. Or you want, you know, it's just depends on your taste. <laughs> what a great analogy. Um, now, look, let's talk racing. Let's talk about Benetton. First of all, you, you get your your opportunity with them halfway through 1989. Um, how did it come about? Not only with them, because initially I got a call from uh, Gerard Larousse, who is actually my president in the Club de Pilote de Vancouver du Mans, where I am vice president, and he's a wonderful person. He calls me and he he wants me to race for him, starting from uh, Paul Ricard. In, in 89? In 89, yeah, correct. So I called Ron and I said, Ron, I made it, I made it. And instead of finding an enthusiastic guy, because... We had a good relationship, so uh, I think it, it kind of liked me. He said, yeah, but hang on, take some time. And I said, but Ron, this is what I've been waiting for my whole life. Yeah, but don't say yes immediately. Obviously, he knew something that I didn't know, that there was something else going on. And uh, few, so I, I, I tell Gerard, forcing myself that, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I come and test in Silverstone, but before saying yes, give me a few days. Also, I think he was quite surprised. And uh, Ron told me that Tyrrell was looking for a driver who eventually got um, uh, Jean Alesi. And then I got uh, the call from Benetton, from Flavio, who was just stepping in um, in the team because before there was Peter Collins. Peter, for me, was a, a very, very good manager. But Flavio, I think he wanted to establish his leadership. So he got rid of uh, Peter. And together with him, he decided to get rid of their driver, who is a great friend and a very good driver. So I don't think I deserve to replace Johnny Herbert. But nevertheless, this was the situation. So. He offered me to drive and uh, and on the last minute, because um, Gerard was really waiting and I couldn't buy any more time. I remember he was in Tokyo in the public telephone of my hotel and, uh, and I, he was expecting 
a green light to tell the press and so on. And I said, Gerard, I'm sorry, but I will not be driving for you. And I tell you, Gerard is the most polite, quiet person. He was screaming. I think there was a tsunami through the through the ocean because of his vi vibes in the. And I felt so sorry. And if he would be listening, I apologize. But uh, at the end, Ron was right, and Benetton was a better opportunity for me, in theory. How tough was it for you to step into that car mid-season? And and how much testing did you get prior to arriving at Paul Ricard? I think not testing, but I had enough Formula One mileage, so testing was was not a problem, and uh, and this was not one race, so I had time to adapt to the car. So mileage was not not a problem. I think the season was um, below expectations uh, for different reasons. Uh, that some I blame myself, some a little bit less, but. I was living in Japan. I was testing uh, McLaren, developing McLaren in Japan. I was racing Formula 3000 in Japan. I was racing touring cars in Europe. So flying back and forth sometimes, sometimes arriving on Friday night, qualifying the BMW race and, and, and go back on the, on the plane and test on Tuesday in Suzuka. Um, racing the grand champion in Japan. In that season, I took 103 flights, one flight every 3.3 days. I think I should have been brave enough to say, okay, that's it, I concentrate to Formula One. It's, it's a golden opportunity. I, I wasn't brave enough, different reasons, but was it possible, was it not possible? I don't know, but this for sure didn't help. The fact that the car was built for a um, less tall driver or shorter driver, also was not helping. I remember one race in uh, in, in Heretz where it was uh, running fourth, which was for me a very good result. And towards the end of the race, just my right leg stopped working. It just stopped working. So I just parked uh, uh, because it got uh, down, n numbed. In Hockenheim, my third race and the first with the new car, I was going, the, not I, the car was so fast. Emanuele Pirro was into the pits. Pirro in third place dropped to fourth. But having a fantastic third race in his Grand Prix career in the brand new Benetton Ford. And I was fourth, catching up on Mansell with the Ferrari quite significantly, who was in P3. For God's sake, for me, it was like a dream. And, and I made a, a very silly mistake by clinching a curb on the entry of the motodrome. And then there was drama for Emanuele Pirro. Pirro smashing through two enormous polystyrene blocks at the entrance to the stadium and had hit several of these polystyrene blocks which had badly damaged the front suspension, torn off the rear wing and also hit the driver himself. Given by the fact that I was tall so my head was exposed to the air and... Um, and uh, it, yeah, I, I wasn't in full control, but I blame myself. This is not excuses, you know. There were some situations where I could do better than I did. For different reasons, it didn't work. But again, it was a good opportunity and I would go back. Emanuele, how does tiredness affect racing drivers? You're doing 103 flights. Not only that, you're battling jet lag every time you get on a plane almost. Again, I really don't like to put excuses because I, I think in life, at the end, everybody gets on the long term what they deserve. So what I can say is that if I was 100% concentrated in that, going to the factory and follow everything and then maybe working a little more in the ergonomics, I could have done a slightly better job. But uh, don't forget that we are talking about 1989 where Yes, Formula One drivers were only Formula One drivers, so I was an exception. But not too long before, you would do different kind of races. And, and I didn't get the Formula One drive for the start of the season. This was uh, during the season with all other commitments that I might have been able to stop, but uh, I didn't do. And, and again, blame on me. How quick was your teammate, Alessandro Nanini? 
Yeah, Alessandro, he had an incredible raw talent. If if he was born with somebody else's uh, head, I think we could have seen uh, probably a world champion. Maybe this is the reason why he had so much talent, you know, because he wasn't thinking so much about things. But uh, in terms of driving the car fast, my goodness, it, it really came very easy. It really came very easy to him. It's quite rare in the modern era to have had two Italians next to each other in the same team. Yeah, especially a British team. Yeah, correct. Yeah, but uh, in, in those days, Italians were a little stronger than now. Sadly, we are only represented by by Antonio Giovinazzi, hopefully for a um, few more years. It's not a good period. But in other sports, especially for you guys, English, we are not so bad yeah, okay. as Italians. Moving, <laughs> moving on. <laughs> now, look, how confident were you of staying at Benetton for 1990 or... Did you get wind of, of Nelson Piquet moving to the team? No, no wind because I have, I was I, I still am in a way, but I was naive, and and I thought the team sort of understood the reasons why things were not going as well as expected. It wasn't so bad, but you know I was definitely behind Sandro apart from a couple of uh, of occasions, so I felt good, and then. Um, in uh, in Monza, basically, there was the, the the news without me knowing that. The first you heard was in the media, through the media. Yes, yeah. And, and actually, I was really disappointed by them. But now being more mature and knowing the world a little better, you cannot tell a driver a secret and expecting him not to share it because the, the minute you are out of the team, you are looking for another team. So if you really want the big news to hit the media that the world champion will be driving for you next year, you have to keep your driver uh, away from this. So I don't think I would blame. It was a disappointment, but uh, at the end, what counts is the result. You know, yeah, Flavio could have hugged me. Uh, Pat Simmons, who is, he was a very good team. Rory Byrne, very, very nice people. Very nice people could have hugged me and say, Anuele, a lot of nice words. You are so good, but you know, a three times world champion. But the result would be the same. A little story funny. When I did my first Formula 3000, uh, sorry, Formula Fiat Abarth, so my equivalent of Formula 4 today, my first racing season, we had four races clashing with Formula 2 in Italy. And Formula 2... That year, 1980, the top team was Tolman with uh, Brian Henton and Derek Warwick. So every spare minute I had, I went there and, and looked for them because for me, that was the ultimate dream. Very good team, nice people. And Pat and Rory were the most wonderful people because they saw me, probably they saw in my eyes this, uh, uh, this I don't know, admiration. And then they really welcomed me and, you know, they allow me to talk to them and they, they, they made me feel good, let's put it this way. And um, this is 1980 and nine years uh, later, I drive for them, Pat Siemens, Rory Byrne, and they're still very nice and we're still in very good terms. So... Motorsport produces good stories. It does. It certainly does. Now, look, what about Scuderia Italia then? How hungry were you to stay in Formula One at the end of 89? And how did that opportunity with, with BMS Scuderia Italia come about? Uh, hungry a little bit, but not desperate. Scuderia Italia came through Marlboro, who were always really good. But um, I think they were looking after their drivers a, a, a little better some, somehow, you know. Um, once I asked um, Helmut Marko, because I, I was responsible for the young driver selection at um, uh, for DTM for Audi for several years, and, and I, I tried to evaluate them in the best possible way, and I thought, you know, once I bumped into um, in, into Helmut, and it, maybe I, not maybe, I, I want to learn something from him, so I asked Helmut, what criteria do you use to evaluate the dri your drivers and so on, expecting a, st a, a structured and uh, an interesting answer. And he said, uh, of course, in a very Austrian way, well, my criteria is I give a lot of people an opportunity and the first time they, they fail, they go home. 
which was a little disappointing because I didn't learn much. I'm sure he has different criteria, but anyway, Marlborough were, I think they were looking after you a little bit more. So, and anyway, so they helped me, although um, Benetton was camel. In fact, again, talking That's about complicated. the past, yeah. yeah, talking about the past, uh, the Benetton season was quite interesting, not only in terms of different things, but um, I was a Marlborough driver. I was working at a contract with McLaren, Marlborough, and carrying Marlborough with the BMW. Benetton was Camel. McLaren was Shell. BMW was uh, sponsored by Wintershall. Uh, Goodyear. I had three different works contracts. It's impossible to make it work today. Impossible. Impossible. I think pretty difficult to make it work back then. <laughs> then uh, I've always been professional and it, and it worked. Everybody accepted it and, uh, and it worked. So Scuderia Italia was a, a logical thing and actually it was really good because my old friend from karting Andrea De Cesaris was the driver so it, it was another world it was a very small team full of uh, beautiful people beautiful people just a nice atmosphere so if you want to put somebody in an environment where is uh, uh, comfortable and only thinks about driving fast that was the team First year was difficult because the car wasn't really good, so we went into pre-qualifying. The second year they kept me, uh, Andrea left and uh, JJ came, and a relatively young and unknown driver, Nigel Copperwhite, designed one exceptional Formula One car, which was the Scuderia Italia 1991. The engine was a V10 Judd, which was a, a decent engine, especially given the financial support, which was very, very poor by Scuderia Italia. And, um, and we went to Phoenix for the first Grand Prix without expecting anything because we came from a very difficult season. We are in pre-qualifying by then, JJ and I. We go and do a, a, a little shakedown in Firebird, There's a very small racetrack outside Phoenix, just, just for the shakedown. Every team, but... Ferrari, if I remember well. And uh, we were second quickest. Only Williams was quicker. Okay, shake down, shake down, don't, don't fly too high, otherwise, you know. And next day is the first day of qualifying. I am fifth quickest. Holy sugar, we have a good car. And uh, unfortunately, because of low budget and not ideal financial management, we did not really keep this advantage so the season was was okay but but in terms of car and I, I was developing the McLaren the V12 engine which was world champion and I think our chassis was a better chassis than the than the McLaren so it, it was a good season enjoyable JJ is a great guy and uh beautiful beautiful tell us a little bit about pre-qualifying I mean to the younger listeners, they won't know what we're talking about. Just uh, how early did it start, first of all? <laughs> what time did the alarm go off? <laughs> Dear younger listeners, <laughs> Formula One was quite different at the time. There were uh, a large number of cars, I think 32, if I'm not wrong. You are a journalist, so you should know better than me. Um, <laughs> and, um, and of course, only a certain number could access to qualifying. So there was a first hurdle or the first yeah, selection, which was the worst cars of the previous years. There were three teams or four, no, four teams, eight cars for four, four places into qualifying. And then you had to qualify after that. And this was one hour on Friday morning, eight to nine, which required, if you are somebody who was a, um, a slow by your rhythm, that, you know, those people who perform good in the afternoon, forget about it, forget about it. And often the truck was damp, the truck was green. And, uh, it, you know, with that car, I didn't pre-qualify three times during the f actually first half of the season, because after... Uh, halfway through, they would reshuffle and, and redo the calculation. So we got out of pre-qualifying. But, uh, you know, a small, small hiccup and, and you're out. So it was stressful. To be ready to leave the pit lane at 8 a.m., what time did you have to get to the track? Quarter to uh, half past six, 
something like that. Fortunately, as an Italian team, we had plenty of espressos, <laughs> so this would would help. But no, seriously, you had to take uh, a lot of risks. And um, and um, I remember in in Imola where JJ actually made it to the podium, which was a a great achievement for Scuderia Italia. In pre qualifying, he had a problem with the car, so I they asked me if he could step in my car so i did my runs very very quickly and then got out this is in one hour I got out gave him my car and he out qualified me because the, uh, maybe it was quicker i don't know but i think if you look at the qualifying over the year we were pretty equal but the track was better so first of all i was kind enough or stupid enough to really, really speed up my thing because I don't know if many people would, would have done it. And uh, and then the car, which was would be solidly past the hurdle because often we qualified in the top 10, didn't make it. There's one racetrack I'd love to ask you about, and it's Monaco, because when you look at your record, you were always quick in Monaco. Why was that? Honestly, I think part of it is the Pirelli tires and um, who were good qualifiers. And also, I love street circuits. I've been good in Macau, good in Australia. Uh, I just love street circuits. And, and actually, well, I, I love because uh, it, it you can manage the risk. Maybe a car driver must love street circuits because it's, it's about precision. So, yeah. Probably this is this is the reason because if you ask me what is your favorite corner where are you uh, performing the best I'm telling you fast corners I'm not really good in in hairpins or slow corners but somehow street circuits they even overcome this uh, not so high great passion for slow corners that uh, that I have and fortunately the first year of Formula Three Thousand I think I qualified. Uh, eight or uh, seven, eight, nine, seven, for sure top 10 and the engine wouldn't start. So this was a little disappointment. Now there's there's a race at the end of 91 that I found myself thinking back to very recently when we were at Spa and we couldn't get the race started this year because of that torrential rain. I found myself thinking about Adelaide 91, which uh, prior to the Spa this year was the shortest race in Formula One history, just those 14 laps. Senna goes through, Mansell goes through, Berger is still third, PK is fourth, Patrese is fifth, Morbidelli is sixth, Piro is seventh, Vincenzo is eighth. I wouldn't be at all surprised if this race is going to be stopped. It's absolutely lashing down in the start and finish point. Senna's waving there, Senna waving to the clock, to the... Uh, stop people on the start finish line and Senna is now getting very agitated indeed stop the race stop the race he's saying red flag is out red flag out red flag on the start finish line so the race has been stopped unsurprisingly and quite correctly you were in that race in Australia what are your memories how bad was it the visibility yeah it was was really bad and uh, to be honest it was uh, scary but we were in the 90s, in the early 90s, and, and this is what we knew, and, um, and, and it was okay. Problem was, um, well, visibility, but I think for me, the, the, where you should really call it the day in a wet race is where, when you cannot go flat on the straight. If you cannot go flat on the straight because the car is aquaplaning and, and you risk to lose the car on the straight, then it's, it's when, you, when you have to stop. Apart from that, Many people love to to race in the in the wet and yeah, visibility was really bad. But I actually enjoyed it. And um, <laughs> I'm sorry to always take time, but there was also an, a, a nice anecdote because um, yeah, visibility was really poor. You could not go flat on the straight. And I was following uh, Patrese on the Williams, so we were quite well placed um, there. And um, and because on the straight is where the cars develop, uh, produce the the highest amount of spray, you, you just don't see. You don't see the light. You could only hear his engine. And according to the uh, level of the sound, you knew how close you were. Uh, Ricardo decides to back off. We were not flat on the straight, you know, maybe fifth instead of six, just the speed according to, to, to your feeling. And I hit Ricardo 
on his back during the race. Nobody crashed, but this was not nice for me and not nice for him. This was really on the early stage of the race. Then the, I knew that was my last Formula One race. So Park Ferme, I stop and I don't get out of the car immediately, even if car is a lake, it, it's a pond and I'm all wet and shivering. I was happy, I was uh, uh, high adrenaline and thinking, okay, I step out for good. And then I feel a big something hit in my head, big time from top to bottom. And it was Ricardo punching my head, the top of my head really, really high because he was still angry. I forgot about that. And we still laugh with Ricardo because basically my bye-bye to Formula One was a big punch in my head by, by Ricardo Patrese. <laughs> Who's such a lovely man and it's quite, yeah. it's quite out of character, isn't it? No, we, we laugh. We are really good friends and he just uh, wanted to show his... Um, you know, there's a lot of adrenaline in these situations and sometimes when we judge what uh, racing drivers do today, it's easy to keep calm when you are when you are sitting at home and um, there's fear, there's adrenaline, there's uh, uh, disappointment. So every reaction somehow has got a reason. You say you knew that was your last Formula One race. Were there any options on the table for 92? No, actually, I, I, I was hoping because with Scuderia Italia, everything was really, really going well. So I felt quite, quite comfortable. Then the, for the following year, they went for two Ferrari engines. And, um, and I, I don't know whether Ferrari did not want me or they, you know, they wanted to put Martini in the car, who was a very good driver, by the way and deserves it uh, at completely. And uh, and they decided to keep JJ because he was good, because he had nasty sponsorship. I don't know. I, I felt I could stay. Uh, circumstances showed that it didn't work. But um, no, I didn't look for, um, for another drive. I, I was happy. I was doing touring cars well and successful and uh, it, it was okay. I wasn't happy, but I wasn't desperate. As I said, I had a side career with a lot of satisfactions beside Formula One. You've won Le Mans five times. How proud are you of that achievement? Not so proud, but very happy. Not so proud because, believe me, uh, Tom, a race like this, is, it's a team effort. So the input of a driver is very limited. You have a lot of chances to screw up and to lose the race, but uh, not so many to, to win it, you know, not the last lap overtaking. I am proud because I had the chance to be part of a, a dream team um, that I, I did realize at the time, but if you think with the hindsight, the length of time that we stayed at the top of the sport, with those resources, with those, with that technology, w with those teammates who were the same for a long time, it was like with all the difficulties be because nothing comes easy and you can imagine, including the accident and so on and so forth. But it was a, with the whole factory backing you, which is very, very important. You, you, we really felt that the whole factory, motorsport was priority, was Audi. Technology motorsport was priority. So we had 100% backing. It was just a dream for a driver. And when you are in, in a comfortable situation, in a healthy and not toxic environment, with good drivers whose uh, rivalry is healthy and not unhealthy, with the team, your team who is working, everything was ideal. And I think drivers were quite important or choosing the right drivers was important, Tom, because uh, I don't know if this was a strategy, but you know we were on an equal level and equal status. Uh, Dindo Capello, Frank Bila, uh, Alan McNeish, uh, Marco Werner, Tom Christensen. So there was no real superstars. We were treated in the same way. Um, and this is very important not to make become the environment toxic. We grew together, Michele for one year, Michele Alboreto, unfortunately, until he had his accident. 
And and uh, it's a number of circumstances that really uh, determine the success and the length of the success that we that we had. I've always wondered this, but to keep that team harmony, are all the drivers paid the same? I don't know. I don't know. I think we were well paid, but um, probably not the same, but, but I don't know. Mm. You know, nobody really spoke about salary. Knowing Audi, I'd be very surprised if there was any discrepancy or major discrepancy, but uh, but I don't know. But really, salary is important, but what is more important, much more important, is the way you are treated. And And, and now in Formula One, I would like to mention names, but you can imagine I can't. But, you know, there are drivers who, who, who go in a team and, and somehow, so actually slowly but surely, they reduce their performance. They make mistakes like they didn't make before. And um, often team principals forget that drivers are human beings with all the senses actually very developed. So a small problem is a big problem when you are in such an intense environment. And even the toughest guy needs a hug sometimes, needs a, re- a reward, uh, needs to be gratified. And, and it's like when you have two brothers who fight each other and, and maybe the mother is talking 51% of the time with one and 49 with you and already you feel jealous. There's a very, very fine episodes that um, I think teams struggle to understand because they they think in, a, in, in with a manager mind. But um, I think there's a lot of uh, lost in translation and, and you see drivers changing team, not only drivers, also sportsmen, football players. Uh, a new trainer comes, the next match they win. It cannot be because of the input. It's just because of the psychological side. Are there parallels to be made between the way Audi went racing and Formula One teams that you race for? My Formula One time was was older and and, uh, resources were much different. A manufacturer is a manufacturer by all means. So, uh, yeah, Formula One team is, he builds the car, but he doesn't build the engine. So... By far, Audi had uh, a more sophisticated, advanced approach. And I, but uh, I believe a lot in mentality or, let's say, processes. Uh, there are teams who will always, always be successful uh, regardless and teams or manufacturers who will never really make it. And it, it, it's a question of DNA you have inside. Uh, Audi was never happy with the second place. They were crisis inside once I've been asked by the the, the former CEO um, to his office to that's a little delicate but basically he, he was close to send everybody home and not the drivers but you know just because there was a small a small uh, hiccup so when you are never satisfied with second place and if you have a second place, you are not blaming people. You are looking for the reasons and you are looking at what yourself could do to improve it. And um, it's rather simple to explain, but not easy to, to make it. I think Audi could have been a successful Formula One team because remember, Audi was doing touring cars, was doing touring cars very well, but touring car, with all respect, is touring car. Then at the end of uh, 97, Dr. Pefken, who was the head of Audi, calls me in his office, seven o'clock in the morning. He tells me, we want to go sports car racing. Keep it for yourself. It's a top, top secret. It was only public a year and a half later. With your experience, do you think we are able to build the car ourselves in uh, in Ingolstadt? Or we need to go in a UK where the knowledge and, and motorsport is uh, well developed? I'm not sharing with you what I said, but the decision was both directions. And if, if you remember, in uh, 99, Audi had two cars built in the UK and two cars built in Ingolstadt. I decided to stay with the with the Ingolstadt, uh, let's say, side. We did the uh, first podium, and it was proven that Audi were able to do it well by themselves. And so, why not Formula One? You don't born with the knowledge but you can learn. 
Do you think Audi will do Formula One going forward sometime soon? I don't know, but I really hope because um, this will also be a little bit of, uh, um, you know, now the whole world is going electric, which uh, there are uh, good reasons for that. But in my personal opinion, things are rushed a little bit too much. So I think if it wasn't for circumstances that happened in the last few years uh, from in the environmental point of view, um, there would be less less of a rush to go in that direction. And I think if, if the Volkswagen Group, with whichever brand, would go to Formula One, I think it's a sign saying that, yes, electric is the future, we are fully committed, but it's not the only thing. Because two or three years ago, everybody was going to Formula E with incredible due respect, because it's almost a miracle what they did. But it was like, uh, if you are an internal combustion engine, you are a bad guy. And and I think this is not only unfair, but is incorrect from a, a scientific standpoint. There's one more question I wanted to ask you about your endurance racing. And that is, maybe a lot of people don't know this, but you made your Le Mans 24 hour debut back in 1981 as a, as a very young driver. I think Beppe Gabbiani was your teammate, wasn't he? But how did it change over the years from 81 right up until your last visit there in 2010? Uh, big time. And, 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 and I'm really happy to have lived the early years of, of my motorsport in, in that way, because it, it's good to know what it was in the good and in the bad. And, and I was really a kid. Um, I, I, I won the Formula Fiat Abarth, which was like Formula 4, uh, championship in my first year of racing, and this was promoted by the Fiat Lancia Group, who, which at the time was was big thing because they were world champion in rally and world champion in endurance. And uh, Mr. Fiorio asked me, "Would you like to come to Daytona for the 24 hours? Bring your helmet just in case." So I fly to Daytona. First time I will race potentially abroad. Uh, just driven the car for half a day for one hour. He decides me to race and, and with uh, Facetti and Finotto in the Lancia Beta Monte Carlo Turbo, we finished the race. At the time, there were two classes for the World Championship, count, counting equal points. So we were fifth overall and first, so top World Championship points in the race, which was a, a, a dream. And, and after that, maybe I proved to be reliable. He said, come to Le Mans. Le Mans, actually, I, I did the, the karting world championship in 1978, so three years before, and, and I took the rental car, don't tell to anybody, without driving license, and I drove the circuit, just dreaming, dreaming, uh, and three years later, I, I was racing there, and it was a nightmare. It was a nightmare because um, the straight was without chicane. So in those days, endurance racing required uh, a smart driving, thinking about the car. We had to back off twice on the straight to let the, the turbine cool down and, and lubricate. So it was a different way of, of racing. My first stint, I do first straight uh, flat out. And the second, there's a major accident with, uh, you can imagine if a car crashes at uh, top speed, there are debris everywhere and um, a poor guy was killed, Jean-Louis Lafosse. So we were passing with a safety car and looking at this horrible scene, which was really not nice. One lap, green flag. Next lap, another big crash uh, later on on the straight with ambulances and people laying on the ground. One marshal was killed. The car was Cherry Butsin who survived, but just like, like a war, a war scene. I stopped after one hour, shocked because these accidents happen on the straight. And I thought, I'm, uh, I, I'm happy to take the risks in motorsport. I believe a lot in meritocracy. If you screw up, I'm prepared to pay the bill. But they didn't put into account that you might get killed without screwing up. Just something breaks in the car in the middle of the straight. Beppe takes the car and he does his one hour. I wait for him with the helmet and he doesn't come back. He doesn't come back. There were no radios. There was no TV. And then the rumor comes that car 67, Lancia Martini 67 crashed and the uh, back straight and the driver is killed, which was not true. But the crash was big, but Pepe survived. And then I told myself, never, ever 
again I will come to this place, never again, until the golden time with Audi, where I fell in love with Le Mans, with the people, with the race, with the environment, with the with with the fans, uh, it, because it was another another era. I had another mentality. Cars were different, and and it was uh, a bitter sweet love affair with that circuit. Were you frightened of Le Mans right up to the end? Was there an element of danger there that didn't exist to other tracks? I've always been frightened, frightened, uh, aware of the risk. So uh, in my whole career, I, I always thought about what could happen. And, and so not in a particular way in Le Mans, just in an analytic way. Le Mans, it's a, it's a high speed truck, so things can happen. It was very difficult the year when uh, Michele Alboreto died. He died um, two months before he died in April and we raced in June. Uh, we decided to go racing for many reasons um, and and it, it, it was tough. The race was uh, like 24 hours. It, it was wet, heavy rain and and there I was afraid. Of course, you drive, you want to do it because you, you have to do it because of yourself, because of the people. but. I was afraid and when we finished the race, I was maybe happier that the race was over than that we won that race. But yes, I think fear, in my opinion, is the best safety tool you can have. More than the halo, more than the uh, runoff areas, more than um, anything else. So I, I think drivers should be, with certain extent, afraid and evaluate the risks. Let's talk about the FIA. Now, Emanuele, you're a driver steward in Formula One. You're on the FIA Drivers Commission, the Circuits Commission. You're a busy man. Specifically, can I ask you about being a driver steward? What makes you do it? It was a coincidence when uh, when Jean Todt decided to take a driver, which, you know, with the hindsight, every decision, every good decision seems easy. But I like challenges. I like to learn. And I thought, OK, this could be a good thing. So uh, I met him and I said, if you need me, I'm happy to do it. So I started since the year one in uh, in 2010 with uh, some, uh, I don't know, I, I fear that uh, the establishment of, of the stewards would not really see us because drivers are always seen as privileged people. Actually, we are privileged. And uh, and sometimes it, it can trigger some some jealousy because you are more in, on the spotlight. But on the contrary, maybe because the way we proposed ourselves or maybe because the stewards were smarter than I thought, it was immediately something that worked very well. Um, they felt we were complementary to their knowledge. Uh, we felt because once you... Stewarding is not only deciding about deciding who is at fault, who is not at fault, five seconds, flip the coin, yeah, let's do a drive-through, uh, something like that. There's a lot of also legal knowledge that you have to learn. And I would not have imagined to have learned so much in terms of just being a man and, and, and analyzing things in a, in, a, in a better way from these uh, stewards uh, people. So I grew up a lot and it's been by far more interesting and challenging than I thought. How difficult is it to make the right call in the heat of the moment during a Grand Prix? It requires a lot of experience, and and this is this was a learning process. Um, I remember in in the first year there was an episode which requires time to tell, but basically I was sure about something, and the three of them were having another idea, and I thought, okay, they are uh, more experienced three versus one, uh, they must be right. And they were wrong. So I thought from now on, if I really humbly but surely believe that something is like this, I will continue insisting. But now it's such a good situation between the driver, the, the other stewards and the drivers. You don't, you don't have to insist. You just present the case from the driver's psychology and, and with the dynamics and the physics that you as a driver know played in, in, into this uh, specific episode. It's never a question of convincing, you just present the way 
you uh, you see it, which is a little deeper than than the others, and it, it's really a work in harmony. Difficult, yes and not, because we have um, tools. We have. Um, I just I, I just try to think in a very very deep way. But once you you have an outcome, unfortunately, from outside things look different. Even drivers who commentate in TV with their experience, they they don't have this specific experience of analyzing the depth of the dynamics and the psychology. And even them, sometimes they struggle to understand until you speak to them. They're all friends, so it, it's easy. And then they say, oh, yeah, I didn't think about that. I didn't think about that. So like anything, it requires experience. And I think about this every day because I take it very, very, very serious for the sake of uh, justice. One thing that helps me is that I have no sympathy. As a character, I have a sporting attitude. So I don't support, I, I do support a little bit the football team, but you know, we had the derby just uh, just a few days ago, Rome, Lazio. I support Roma. If Lazio plays well, that's fair. They deserve to win. So I'm not somebody who is really, uh, how to say, uh, linked to sympathy. Of course, there are drivers I like more or less, but this is not uh, impeding me to take a good decision, which helps a lot. There are some I don't like at all, but... You have to treat them all equally, I suppose, don't you? Yeah. Uh, it, it's not difficult to treat them equally because it does not really affect me so much, this, as a character. What about the influence of social media on the job? And and I'm thinking specifically about one race, Canada 2019. Oh, he's gone oh, wide. Sebastian Vettel goes wide and Lewis Hamilton thought there was a gap. But the wall and Sebastian Vettel moving to the right-hand side closed that gap down. Has Vettel just got away with an error and preserved his lead in this Canadian Grand Prix? We've got a five second time penalty for unsafe re entry. Sebastian Vettel takes the checkered flag, but Lewis Hamilton wins the Canadian Grand Prix. The stewards gave Sebastian Vettel a five second penalty after um, during his battle with Lewis Hamilton, and it got pretty unpleasant after the race, I think, didn't it? No, oh, very much, very much unpleasant. It, in a way, changed my my life and and also my perception. Um, now my relationship with social media is definitely different. I I see and and it hurts me more when I see people complaining. Human being, I I think the social media enhanced the one characteristic that we all more or less have, which is complaining and frustration. I think social media gives the tool to many people to express their frustration. Unfortunately, with uh, not with the knowledge required to analyze a certain thing. And, uh, and so that was really unpleasant, but more than, than all the insults that, that I had, it was because that was a straightforward situation. Just people did not understand. And at the end of the day, the whole motorsport of Formula One lost something because majority of the world had a bad perception. So at the end, I made just or we made justice to one racing episode. This was hurting the whole Formula One because it was perceived in an incorrect way. So um, this hurt me because I love the sport so much. And I thought, for God's sake, why don't they understand that the one who has to win has to win and not the one you want to win. I think the whole world wanted Sebastian Vettel to win because because he was going through a tough time, because he would have been one off. It was just a wonderful story. If you score and it's offside, it's got to be offside. Somebody has to take this decision to make sport uh, fair. Hear, hear. But I don't think Sebastian helped you by swapping the boards first and second boards in Park Ferme. Yeah, he did not. But um, uh, we never, we, we thought about sitting down and talk about it, uh, but we never did. He was uh, nice just the race after I was walking in the paddock and he just tapped my shoulder. Uh, I, 
I really think he's a very good guy, Sebastian, but in the heat of the moment, he felt um, ripped off, which which is fair, which is fair, you know. Even myself, uh, in fact, there was an episode where I almost stopped racing in touring cars back in the 90s. I, I got uh, penalized by something that I thought it was so unfair, so unfair. And because of my strong sense of justice, I thought I don't recognize me anymore in this sport. I want to stop and I was really close to stop. It really hurt me. I still won the championship. It didn't affect I was at all the the racing uh, situation. And and now with the you know with YouTube I saw the episode and I thought I I was an idiot. It was my fault and this actually sometimes I share with people that get penalty because some people they really try to be smart and they know they are guilty, but some others, which I think it's the case of Seb, I'm sure maybe now with the hindsight, not. And and if we ever sit down in front of a coffee, I am sure he would see in a different way, but I'm I'm sure he felt like uh, uh, that one win was stolen. And so this is a reaction. So that's, that's fine, that's fine. Oh, I'd love to listen to that conversation if you and Seb do have that coffee. <laughs> he's a he's a good guy. I I, I like him. He's a smart person. So yeah. um, maybe one day we'll we'll do it. Emanuele, you're a very smart person, and I've absolutely loved chatting to you. We've I feel we've had a wonderful chat. When when you look back at your career as a whole, not just Formula One, is there anything you do differently? No, I don't. I just don't like this attitude. Yes, a lot of things I should have done different, but I think uh, failures or mistakes are there to teach you a lesson. So definite, and, and I'm a positive guy. So if I look back, I had a lot of difficult moments and uh, by far things could have been better. But the, the only thing I can think of if I look in, in my rear view mirror, is a smile. I'm so happy from a personal side. I I came across so many wonderful people you cannot even imagine. So many smart people that I learned a lot from them. Just life was so generous to me that I cannot, I don't even dare to think I could have done better. It's just a, a wonderful path and you'll be surprised, but I still believe that the best is yet to come. Well, racing is very much the family business still, isn't it? Because both of your sons are engineers, one working for Sauber, the other for Prima uh, in the junior categories. So it is. Yeah. They're still involved. Yeah. Uh, you you know, parents, they always want to transmit their dream. And my dream has always been to be an engineer. I actually started uh, engineering school, but because of racing, I, 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 I didn't continue. And this is a little bit of a frustration that I have because I, I like technology and engineering so much. I, I keep learning and studying and uh, updating, but I'm not an engineer, period. So this is a little frustration. And so the fact that they both went to that direction, it's really good to me and they keep me young they keep my mind young we talk about racing every day every evening on the phone and we keep growing each other i transmit to them what i know and and of course with the age i have without them i would be a lot older in my in my mind so it's a win-win situation the only loser in this affair is my wife because she starts hating motorsport <laughs> can't get away from it yeah. <laughs> um, did either of your boys want to race? Yeah, very much so. And uh, and I really believe they could have been good. One last year did the Formula Ford Festival without having done any race before with his own pocket money because I, I don't like that helping. I just went there because it was a wonderful... Um, occasion. Yeah, yeah, occasion. Yeah, thank you. And uh, and he did he did really well considering never been to Bransach, never driven a Formula Ford. It was wet and damp, so the most difficult condition you can you can think of. I think they could be good, but the difference between good and very good is um, very imperceptible. And I think if you cannot make living out of motorsport, you better do something else. And 
I knew when I started and by far I was not uh, sure about the career, but with you, you're a lot braver than with your children. And I thought, you know, if they start racing and they don't make it, they end up with uh, with nothing. And to determine how good you are, it's very, very, very difficult. Even if you're not a father, okay? I'm a more objective father than most of the fathers. So I see the faults more than the others, but still it's difficult. So um, I, I push them for the safer, for the safer path. It's a wonderful family you have, Emanuele. And I'm delighted that I started working in Formula One just after you had retired. So I love going to the Goodwood Revival meeting and seeing you hanging it out in, a, in an E-type Jag or a, whatever it is you're racing. It's, it's great to see you still loving it so much. Yeah, this is why I'm a happy person, because I really got what I have. And, and it's like, um, uh, you know, when you are at the end of, uh, of your career, it's like when you are eating a dish that you really like it. And then there's just one or two mouthful left and you chew them and you chew them and you enjoy them and you enjoy them and, uh, until because you know there is not so much more left and uh, and and this is why I'm a happy person and thank god I have the ability to share it with people I don't feel ashamed to share it with people and that's also good because I would like everybody to be in this wonderful bus journey that uh, that I made or I'm I am making well, thank you very much for sharing it with us today. It's been wonderful to chat. Thank you, Emmanuel. Thank you. What a fascinating, passionate man. I took so much away from that chat, not least that Emmanuel deserved better in his Formula One career. He was a fast driver, and I'm surprised that more teams didn't try and cash in on his experience with McLaren and Honda. And what an incredible few years that must have been, working with Honda in Japan. And his insight into life as a Formula One steward was eye-opening. Even if his description of the aftermath of the 2019 Canadian Grand Prix proved to be a little shocking. Emanuele, thank you for your time. I love talking to you and look forward to seeing you at a race again soon. As ever, please send in any stories or thoughts that you have on Emanuele. Did you see him race in Formula One? Or did you see him pounding around Suzuka in a McLaren Honda? Let me know. And remember, I'll read out the best ones next week. Which brings me on to what you sent in about Ruth Buscom after last week's episode. And I'm delighted to say that many of you enjoyed hearing from her. So here's a tiny proportion of what was sent in. Let's start with this from Rachel W. I loved this interview, says Rachel. Ruth is so in tune with everything and not just every aspect of Formula One, but also with the world at large. You're bang on right there, Rachel. And thank you for getting in touch. And how about this from Data Hotcakes? This episode has elevated Ruth to being my favourite person in the paddock. Smart, focused and passionate about the sport she loves. It's a great episode. Well, thanks, Data. Or can I call you Hotcakes? I can't disagree with anything you've written there. And Son of Ice and Fire sent this in. Brilliant episode with Ruth Buscombe. She's an incredibly talented race strategist and a role model for driving equality and diversity forward. I really hope she'll get another shot at Ferrari making title-winning decisions. Well, thank you, Ice and Fire. Great to hear from you and thank you for that message. And let's go next to this from Christopher Daly. I've listened to all episodes of Beyond the Grid and to me, the Toto Wolf interview was the best. Until I listened to this one. It was absolutely brilliant. Ruth is very passionate about what she does and it shows in the great details she goes into with each of her answers. We need a part two. Thank you, Christopher. And I thought what really came across was just how Ruth's got it, every aspect of her job. And let's end with this from Romo. What an amazing lady, an inspiration to everyone, no matter the path they choose to follow. Brilliant, just brilliant. Thanks, Romo. That is a lovely message and you're echoing the sentiments of many others. I'm going to stop there, but thank you to everyone who wrote in. We love getting your messages and read them all. Well, that's it for another week. 
I hope you enjoyed hearing from Emanuele. And don't forget to send in your thoughts and stories on him. As ever, I'll be back next week with another great guest from the world of Formula One. So see you then. Beyond the Grid is produced by F1 in association with Audioboom. Until next time, keep it flat out.